Hi guys, thank you all for joining us today. Um, you know, we're currently facing an unprecedented situation with the pandemic, coronavirus. Um, so we decided to put on a series of webinars to kind of help founders in our community, as well as the external community um, with situations they're currently facing. So yeah, so what have we seen so far, um, the impact of COVID? So we've done a recent poll of wire companies across all our global hubs. And what we've seen is that it's negatively, negatively impacted most of our startups about 75% regardless of the geography, the way they do business. So, you know, it's a global impact that we are seeing. So in terms of where exactly the, we're seeing the most impact, so 43% have seen a fall in commercial activity and also um, startups are actively seeking um, financing due to the crisis. Then we're seeing that startups have reported that they will not survive. If twenty percent of startups have reported they will not survive if the crisis lasts more than three months. And I'm struggling to use that. Apologies. Consider it to be positive influence in their business due to the acceleration of the digitalization process. And fifty nine percent of startups are generating a positive impact on society due to the crisis, which is great. So today our panelists are and then Sophia, manager at KPMG also direct at Foundervine. Then we've got Jean uh, from Managing Partner Extension Ventures. We've got Yvonne, principal at got Matt with us today, um, partner at Ada Ventures. So in terms of today's agenda, um, so we're just going to discuss some key challenges that are happening that we're seeing across the board at the moment. And then we're going to go through some Q&A sessions that um, our attendees will be submitting. And then just a final summary in closing with a 12 o'clock finish. So yeah, guys, it'd be great if you guys, um, our panelists, can jump into kind of introducing themselves, um, a quick one to two minute intro about what you do and kind of your thoughts on COVID so far and the impact that you've seen across the landscape. David, do you want to start? Great. <clears throat> okay, I'll kick off. Uh, so hi, everyone. My name is David Faseo and I'm a manager at KPMG working within our digital delivery division for financial service companies. And we build products and help um, banks bring propositions live to market for the customers. In addition to this, I am also the director of products and program at Foundervine, and we are a non-profit that's on a mission to change the global face of entrepreneurship. So since the launch in 2018, we've supported over 2,000 women and ethnic minority founders to create, test, and launch entrepreneurial ventures. We've also birthed circa 70 startups who all very much operate in that early startup um, space. And a number of these have gone on to kind of raise additional fundings and actually bring live products to market. So, and in terms of just challenges to COVID so far, so let's just acknowledge that it's an extremely challenging and difficult time for everyone, the government included, and like we're all playing our part to kind of learn and adapt to a scenario that very few of us could have um, um, planned for. So um, looking forward to discuss further as we kind of move into this. Great, thank you. Jean? Yeah, hi, I'm Jean de Fougerol. Um, I'm the managing partner of Ascension Ventures. We're, we're an early stage seed fund. We're also investors in residence at, at Wira. So I think in the, in the last five years, we invested in 90 companies, of which 17 came through the Wira cohort. So we're pretty active in the space. Um, obviously, very difficult situation. We are, like most VCs, very focused on um, looking at the portfolio and trying to help them understanding what their runway is and working with them to kind of find solutions. So I would say the issue for a lot of startups is, is a lot of VCs at the moment will be very focused um, supporting their own portfolio. So it's going to really slow down any new investments would be my kind of highlight. And we can go into more detail on that um, later. Matt. Um, hey everybody, um, I'm Matt, one of the two founding partners of Ada Ventures, which closed its fund, um, thank the big man upstairs, um, at the end of last year, so we're not, not currently fundraising. Um, we have a £30 million fund that is a pre-Series A strategy, mostly, mostly it's pre-seed, it's the earliest stage of seed, and we are investing in overlooked founders uh, and, and or overlooked markets. Um, we will write checks from... 250k to to a million i guess the first check um uk only uh focused on you know, differentiated technology companies in consumer healthcare and future of work sectors 
in terms of COVID, I wouldn't add anything to um, what's already been said, other than interesting observation. One of the interesting observations I've had is people in portfolio companies bifurcating between wartime CEOs and peacetime CEOs, to use Ben Horowitz's um, descriptions. Founders who, in some way, shape, or form, are kind of almost relishing the challenge and the problem set, and that's bringing out the best in them. Um, it was what I call a wartime CEO. Um, and it's just an incredibly different skill set for running a business in this environment compared to, to six weeks ago or, or, or a few weeks ago and, and what it will be again, hopefully, in the not too distant future. And last but not least, Yvonne, please. Yeah, so good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Yvonne Magella. I'm principal and founder member at Impact Tax. Uh, so it's a UK based venture capital fund investing in unrepresented founders. Um, we typically invest Series A and, and seed rounds um, across Europe. And um, just to echo um, my, uh, my fellow panelists, I think it is definitely a really challenging um, environment at the moment. Particularly what we're seeing is um, in terms of companies are trying to continue to, to have momentum, um, a lot of consumers and businesses have obviously clamped down their spending. Um, and so that's definitely been, been a major challenge. Um, and I think for a lot of uh, VCs, the priority has been their existing portfolio companies. Um, we'll delve a bit deeper in that as we uh, continue the conversation. Yeah, so in terms of, um, I guess the first question is, in terms of the current VC landscape, I mean, you all work with entrepreneurs at various ends of the spectrum, but um, what are you seeing? What are the kind of changes that you've seen? and um, how, you know, within your portfolio and also what you're seeing within the industry and fellow investors? Well, I mean, if you can divide the kind of investors in the UK into two parts, you've got the kind of SEIS, EIS investors, which, which are high net worths or angels or people um, who run EIS funds like Ascension. We have two institutional funds and we have SEIS, EIS funds. So, there's that bit, and then there's the institutional funds, um, you know, that have got a pool of capital already committed. I would say on the SEIS, EIS funds, and angel kind of all of that has pretty much dried up 100% for the moment. When that will, I think, um, once people are allowed out of their houses and like the lockdown eases, um, some level of like confidence and normalcy will, will come back, and then you'll be hit with probably quite a deep recession. So. I think all of that market um, is drying up, which is, you know, not great for the early, early stage environment. And then on the VC side, um, they're slowing down new investments and really focused on um, portfolio. And if they do new investments, I think they'll just do a lot less, um, be, you know, only picking like one or two of the best things they're seeing coming through and making sure there's, you know, 18, 24 month runway on, on any new, new investments that people make. Matt, have you got anything to add to that? Um, I would check out, uh, I tweeted out Harry's podcast yesterday uh, with his partner, Fred. I'd listen to that because I think Stride deserves credit as coming out as saying, we're on pause. This is not business as usual. We are not, quote, unquote, open for business. Um, and I think, you know, that's a, you know, VC should be more honest about whether they're open for business or not. And it's hard to do that. You've got to be brave to do that because you never want to stem the tide of deal flow. But I think that's really important for founders. Founders need to know like where the investors stand. So I think you know, it makes a really good point there. Like angel investors, they are shut for business, right? There's no doubt about it. And just to see, make that assumption. Our assumption on like from the sort of early part of the seed market where we operate is there's an 80 to 90% reduction in that capital market. So I would say that hopefully that doesn't last too long, but I would say that bluntly to founders now, there is you know, almost a disappearance of a capital market overnight. Because funds that we're trying to that we're raising, they're not closing those funds. Like the LPs just suck out of the room immediately when there's something like this happens. Uh, the institutional LPs, that's the investors in our funds, right? So if you are raising fund right now, that's you're, that's not getting closed. Secondly, most funds that are raised are 40 plus percent invested, probably. Um, they're small funds. People have been investing quickly. It's been a bull market. Um, and those funds are. From what I hear, in the honest conversations I'm having with other investors, they are reserving practically 100% of their remaining capital for their existing portfolio companies. 
And then the third aspect is kind of just human nature that happens in something like this. Like we all just kind of shrink back, right? We're all just like, whether it's personal finances or whether it's, you know, a business you're running or a fund you're managing, you can't help but become more conservative. So what does that mean for a fund that is actively investing, you know, like like our fund or job fund or you know, some of the other funds here? Um, like that means that we're probably writing smaller checks, we're probably not being as aggressive with the first check. Um, we're probably, you know, reserving more capital. So we're going to make less in the velocity of investing is going to reduce. Um, and and frankly, the bar is higher because we're just in that kind of market of a sort of like a flight to quality element. So we're just looking for things that are much more of a you know, bang on fit to thesis. So I think I would just call it out and say, I think there's a 90% reduction in the availability of capital compared to what there was a month ago. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thanks for that. I mean, so there's been kind of a, a Google sheet, which some of you know, I think Sifted also posted about so many funds saying it's business as usual. So, Yvonne, what do you say to that? Like um, Matt just said, you know, his thoughts, but what do you say to quite a few funds advertising, well, hey, actually, we are still kind of deploying cash at the moment? Yeah, I mean, I totally agree in, in um, what Matt said that it's not necessarily business as usual, despite the fact that. You know that is the the conversation that's been been currently held. I think, I think just more broadly, the bar's definitely been set higher by VC. So you know more attention is being paid to how long the the funding runway will actually get you, um, and and whether your company is actually well positioned in the COVID nineteen world and the post COVID nineteen world, whatever that will look like. And I guess for for companies that are in the midst of fundraising that have less than you know twelve months of runway. Uh, they really need to think about their narrative and, and crafting a story around why your company will actually be enhanced by um, an, an infusion of capital at the moment and not just surviving in this environment. And, you know, I guess thinking more practically again, you may want to, they may, companies may want to consider if investors have already shown interest, think about taking convertible notes as opposed to waiting for the round to fill up. Um, because where you previously had commitment, you know, some VCs have paused um, and, and where cash is on the table, definitely do take it right away. For companies that are thinking of, of raising later in the year, I think it's really important that, again, you, you think about whether you want to accelerate that fundraise um, and do it earlier as opposed to later on in the year, because we just don't know what's going to happen. There's, there's talks of us potentially entering into depression. Um, and so, right speaking at impact test we're focusing on our existing portfolio companies and so capital in terms of new investments is, is definitely uh, drying up and, and we're going to see a, a continuous tightening of that. and and sorry can i just add it's not only it's also time i mean the, the amount of time that that we're spending with the existing portfolio understanding you know what the cash flow is you know obviously everybody's looking at cutting costs to extend runway but it's, you can't just cut costs you need to kind of make sure that you know, you're working on the right product um, or getting the right product market fit for a world where you, you can raise money in six to nine months. So there's just a lot of time kind of supporting and that that's like hours and hours of meetings with, mm -hmm. with um, portfolio, which, you know, is different from business as usual as well. Yeah. yeah. So we kind of all know kind of the current situation at hand. So for those, you know, Vaughn and John have kind of briefly touched on it in terms of for those who are trying to close it in the next three months, um, and, you know, quite frankly, they quite need the cash right now. So what advice do you give to those um, who are trying to implement a strategy to help them close within the next few months? David, I know you work with quite early stage entrepreneurs who quite early on in their journey. Do you, what advice are you given at the moment if you can speak to that? Great. So I'll tell them two things. So firstly, um, from the point of a founder or early stage startup, I want to say, and um, don't be scared to kind of to maybe pivot. So what we've heard here is that there's going to be a lot more challenge around the viability of a business plan. What is it you're trying to achieve, whether you're just starting off or whether you have been working for 12 months. So these questions are going to be more drastic. And as a early stage startup, you've got to be kind of willing to that challenge and be ready to be kind of receptive to potential change. And um, it shouldn't be daunting because one thing I'll add is that a lot of great companies that we see today came out of the last crisis, the likes of Uber, Airbnb, Credit Karma. Um, so there is an opportunity to find business models and understand what is your positioning and where, what is it you're offering to the market. So that's kind of one element. But the second piece for someone who's asking, okay, I get that, but I, I need cash. So I know my might demonstrate it a bit later, but there are some initiatives which are being introduced to try and 
plug those gaps. And I think we can go um there could be a bit more done, but there are certain initiatives which are kind of coming out there to at least provide um early stage startups with access to potential um funding or loans. So one specific I might just touch on is kind of the coronavirus business interruption scheme, which is being kind of set up to um, provide loans at overdrafts and it's got fully approved lent, uh, underwritten by the government through the British Business Bank and have a number of lenders there to kind of support. So benefits of this, they're waiving interest payments for a year, so and there are no guarantees required for companies who are taking out less than 250. Um, there are some cons, so since launch, only about 2,000 applications out of 300,000 have been accepted, which is 1%. So we can see that that's um, for someone who needs to raise Fund today and they can't go through the traditional kind of investment route, this is not fully plugging that just yet, but it is something that is kind of trying to go into that direction. Yeah, and I would also kind of differentiate between um, startups that have already raised money and those that are just at the beginning of the journey. I think startups that have raised money, um, obviously the first thing to do is go back to your existing investor base and see if you can come up with a plan with your chairman or your lead investor of, of how to get out of this, how to extend the runway and how to come out of this, you know, with, with a good, better product. Um, so it's difficult to generalize, but obviously focusing on product market fit or building a product while you're waiting for customers to come back is, is one thing I know a lot of my portfolio are currently doing. Um, there are some other initiatives coming through. Um, I think the government's told Innovate UK to get more grants out quicker, um, and they've just come up with a kind of COVID grant scheme for any kind of COVID related products or initiatives for 50,000 pounds. I think British Business Bank is looking at a runway fund, but again, that will take months to come down the line and will probably be deployed through the British Business Bank VC. So if you don't have money from one of those, that might be challenging. And I think ELSIF, London Mayor's office is talking about doing another kind of um, putting more cash into the LCIF um, funds. So that's for businesses that kind of have investors. You need to work with them to come up with a plan, obviously. And then those that don't, I think, will be more challenging. And Matt, um, are any of your portfolio companies raising, and have you given them any advice in this current time? Um, yeah, um, I think yes to both, but I think what I pick up on is um, possibly you know, David's comment about pivoting, because um, I think that's a really, you know, important consideration. And I'd kind of go a step further, actually. And I would say capital has been readily available um, and relatively cheap for quite a long time um, in the market in which we all operate. Um, and that just changed overnight. And when there's, you know, free availability of capital like that, you can end up with businesses getting funded relatively easily. Things become a bit slacker. You know, this is a time now of entrepreneurs who are completely and utterly mission locked with what they want to do. And those entrepreneurs will all survive through this period because capital is just a, a kind of byproduct to them of what they're trying to achieve. Like they are so certain in the future that they see, and that galvanizes capital, even in markets like this. And I think picking up on David's point about pivot, I would, I'm sort of talking to entrepreneurs about, you know, reassessing their, their, even their fundamental reason for being in this business. Because there's a lot of tourist entrepreneurs who got into business with a startup because it seemed kind of cool and fun. Hey, there's always going to be a job out there if this doesn't work. We're now in an utterly different environment. So I would use it as a proactive kind of time to say, to reassess the, you know, the reasons for being in that business. And if that comes out positively, that may result in a pivot like David's talking about, which seen in examples over history of those pivots being massively successful. This is a time to consider those things. I know it's hard, to, it's easy for me to say this, it's hard to hear this like, you know, I need cash tomorrow to make payroll. Maybe you do, but, but only if that business is still the one that you fundamentally, desperately believe in authentically is the change in the world that you need to see comes through that business. So I really like that suggestion about pivot. I think it's useful to, to think about it in a cold light of day situation. However you do that, I'm advising entrepreneurs to go for a run, do if you're allowed to and being safe and the rest of it, like do the thing that takes you out of your headspace, even if it's just for 20 minutes uh, of like trying to make payroll next week. Like, cause that's, you're thinking fast, your brain is hard. 
do something to kind of think slow and soften your mind and think about think about that bigger picture where do i want to be in, is this the thing i want to spend the next five years of just you know crushing pressure and what have you to do because they're the businesses that do pop out the other side and become airbnb and ubers of this world yeah so just um if i may um on the topic of pivot we just had a question come in from one of our founders and the question is how do you deal with these big sim investors with pivoting your product strategy at this stage and will a product with a shorter selling cycle more focused use case and a broader customer base be appealing sorry i didn't fully hear that no worries. So the question was, how do you deal with, <clears throat> so excuse me, with existing investors and pivoting your product strategy at the stage, and will a product with a shorter selling cycle, more focused use case, and a broader customer base be more appealing? I think that you really have to sit down and think, um, where is their their founder market fit as well? So, where do you actually want to be? Not just where the opportunities lie, but where you think you can actually take the business, and is it just something that you see yourself doing? Um, I think that, you know, it's, it is a great time to, to be thinking about what opportunities are currently arising on this current market environment and really seeing how you can leverage those opportunities. Um, and so if you can be more and more focused on what particular area that you think is, is going to help you thrive in this environment, then, then definitely do think about it. In terms of communication to investors, I think that at this particular time, it's it's very important that you almost over communicate with your investors. You want to be ensuring that they're in the loop with any decision that you're making. Um, keep involved. They may they are likely to be able to add value as well. And so if you are thinking about pivoting, then just have that open um, channel of communication where you can bounce ideas off your investors. Um, because you know now is an opportune time to be really thinking about that pivoting and where you can actually you know pivot the business to to really thrive. Um, and so. I'm sure that investors would, would be open to that conversation. Thank you. And I guess um, now a lot of the advice has been kind of like founders should manage their runway. Um, so what advice would you guys give in terms of what you've been telling your portfolio companies about how they should manage their runway effectively? John, do you want to take um, that one? Well, yeah, I mean, we've basically been working with them on, um, trying to see how we can get get them to we basically have um a rag like red amber green so, so so anybody who's got um less than six months runway is red and um up you know between six and 12 months is amber and, and 12 months and above is is green and we're trying to get everybody up to green so it's difficult to say but obviously um you can look at fur furloughing staff um cutting costs You've got to be quite conservative on your revenue assumptions. I've had quite a few companies, like particularly enterprise SaaS businesses, that even though they've invoiced um, clients, the, the customers, which are big kind of blue chip clients, are saying, I can't pay you for 60 days, 90 days. So so it's, I think it's very difficult to predict revenues moving forward, um, whether you're consumer based or enterprise um, revenues. So it's kind of extending runway without killing the business, which is which, that's the difficult bit. And that's. Um, needs a case-by-case -case approach. Um, does anyone else want to add to that in terms of any tips that you would give to founders in terms of how they should manage their runway? Um, yeah, one of the things is, that we've been talking about is um, picking up on John's point, not killing the business. Like, you've got to find a way to continue to invest in your in your business with the, with the resources that you have. So it's all very well to like slash runway. And again, I would highlight this podcast from Harry and Fred on 20 Minute VC from yesterday, I think. Um, I, I tweeted it out yesterday anyway, if you want to find it that way. But like that talks about this particular issue. Um, and and I think it's really important that the, the slashing costs just kind of wildly. Uh, and then there's like, carefully considered through the prism of what I was saying before about, yes, this is 100% logically, dispassionately what I want to spend the next year of my life, you know, in Broaden. And therefore, where can I sensibly take cost out of the business if possible, but where do I need to keep investing? You know, CapEx is really an important part of, of this mm. kind of, of, of surviving this sort of business, in this sort of situation. It, it's even, you know, I would say kill it immediately, quick death, don't do the bit, which is like a slow, just like an inevitable delay, delaying the inevitable by cutting some costs, but, but it's never going to work. 
through to the sensible, this is still going to work. I'm 100% committed for the right reasons. I can take these costs out, but I must continue to somehow invest in this part of my business, usually CapEx. Awesome. And I guess um, in terms of those who are still kind of trying to raise raise bridge financing rounds, uh, what tips would you give for the remote fundraising process? Specifically, you know, this industry is very social, face-to-face. -face. Um, so, sorry to like, I'll just say one thing, I'll shut up real quick because I don't want to be like that guy. But um, <laughs> one of those, I, was on the, I was on the phone with one of my investors today and I was, I was, I was asking this to share like openly how we do it in our business. I was like, most of our business run on Zoom anyway, but we always meet the entrepreneur and spend time with them in, a, in an environment like, you know, a, a restaurant or what have you. And it's part of our, you know, decision making about, you know, how they interact with strangers and what have you. My investor was like, well, look, you've also got a lot of subconscious bias in those situations as well. So actually going fully digital can remove bias from the process. And mm -hmm. it can also focus, you can focus more of that time on data and like, so actually, I would kind of flip that back to entrepreneurs. So how do you raise capital in this sort of environment? Um, it's, it's a moment for people who can come up with creative ways of doing that. Like, there's no rules about this. Like, you know, my favorite founders are the ones that, like, you know, come back at me in a really good way. I'm sorry, you know, with the great respect, you know, you've got that wrong. And this is, and, and I think it's an environment for that kind of behavior. It's like, yeah, it's going to be digital, right? So, so figure out a way. Instead of sending a pitch deck, Make a 60 second video and send that out to people because people are going to want it's just stuff like that. Yeah. yeah. And I'll be, I'll be quite happy. Yeah. <laughs> and just with that, to add to like founders, so what you're seeing with Zoom and this connectivity, funny enough, people can really have time to to connect a bit. So that continued communication, as well, what Matt said there about creative ways to just get your information in front of them. There is probably a little bit more time now for that to be done as long as what you're coming with is something that's relevant and is directly linked to kind of proving this is a viable model, this is something I'm passionate about, and that you're providing information that is necessary and they can actually move the needle a bit. And, and maybe if you haven't raised money yet, it's a great time to, get, to try and get into an accelerator because you could be housed, um, fed and watered and like um, demo days, access to investors, you can focus the next year, like within an accelerator, building your product to come out strong with the other side. So it's a bit like during a recession, people go off to get a master's degree because there are no jobs out there. No, not that we go, go, going in an accelerator is like a second best thing, but in the app, like it's a great thing to be doing for the next 12 months to really build your product and uh, your kind of ecosystem. Some great advice there, guys. Um, so I guess we'll move on to kind of the current government, government funding options. So there's so many to know about. So I think you've kind of covered the grant funding that's available, but in terms of, I guess, the debt versus equity argument, what, what are your thoughts on the current um, CDI-LS scheme? Well, yeah. Oh. yeah. Go ahead. Go ahead, please. No, so I, I think the the business interruption loan scheme is is obviously good and a speedy way for for businesses to get access to finance um, for a large demographic of businesses in the UK. However, for high growth companies, they're just not built for immediate profitability, or they have don't have assets to provide security, and so a lot of banks have, have turned them away. Um, so I don't think that's that's the the right approach for for startups. And I know that a lot of startups have been spending their time focused on trying to access their loans, and I, I don't think that's that's um, time well spent. I think one of the schemes I think has been pretty good is the um, job retention scheme for the furloughing of staff. Um, you know that ensures that staff are able to get paid, and they'll hopefully be able to return back to their jobs in the aftermath of this. Um, so I know that a number of early stage companies I've spoken to in the last week are, are looking to take advantage of that. But at the same time, it's really important that if you are going to decide to furlough staff, you try and maintain that balance because you don't want to avoid losing momentum of your business. Um, and I think it's more important than ever to really try and remain competitive and try and grow the business, in, even though you are going to be trying to re reduce costs. I think also from a practical perspective, you know, one of the, the questions I've used quite a lot this week is actually how to manage following staff um, simply because you know it can have an impact on employees well-being and mental health so one of the things that you know I'm advising founders to think about is just be really transparent when communicating with your staff 
um, and try and be really empathetic during this time as well, uh, because, you know, people are going through different emotions and um, providing that level of, of confidence in your employees if you are choosing to value them is, is very important. John, did you want to add something there? No, I, I think that, yeah, the loan schemes are for, I think, later stage companies. Um, and I think the fine print is kind of, you need to apply if, had you applied pre-COVID, you would have been accepted. So I don't think they're, they're lowering the bar, even though the government's kind of um, giving them 80% guarantees and they're asking for um, personal guarantees up to 250,000 pounds. So it's certainly not relevant for most of our portfolio. Yeah. Well, yeah, I think um, also kind of one of my final questions, and then we'll move on to the Q and A. Is um, what more do you think the government can be doing in comparison to other European countries? So in France, we've seen that they've um, got a 5.3 billion euro fund for um, entrepreneurs out there, startups out there. So what more can the government be doing to support, you know? UK startup ecosystem. Yeah, so, uh, so, so this week, I mean, we get to kind of get everyone's view on this actually. So, we saw a couple of tech um, players come together to put together the Save Our Startup proposal, which basically put together some recommendations to, to the government on how they can kind of bridge that gap. And there are kind of like three key points. One was around introducing equity based solutions, probably kind of similar in a way to like the bank bailouts we saw. Um, in 2008, where, for instance, RBS and Lloyd's, where the government essentially invested 50 billion for equity, and again, kind of these um, see much faster from public funding schemes such as the Innovate UK funding grants, and then making um, these private investment schemes such as EIS and SEIS more um, attractive. Because so we kind of heard there that oh, from angel investment point of view, it's kind of a, at a nearly 100% stop. But if you made these incentives um, more attractive, could that increase? Um, so at the moment, it's like a 50% tax income relief and no capital gains tax after a period. But if you increase that to 70% or 80%, for instance, would that um, kind of generate more activity in the marketplace? It kind of bridge that gap to what's happening in maybe the likes of France, Germany, and Denmark. But um, very interesting to kind of hear, um, especially the people from the VC funds, their views on some of that as well. Matt, you, you're, probably, you're probably closest to BBB, given that you're a recipient. Yeah, yeah, and they've been engaging with the whole, the whole, the whole portfolio of managers um, quite actively. Now, I think there's a lot of wild flailing around at the moment, and I think that everybody's got some different objectives. So, um, I think it's, in, yeah, I, and I think everyone is self-interested. So, I, I think the government is looking at this, saying we've built an amazing tech ecosystem in the UK in the last five years, especially. Um, you know, third only to China and US probably, we don't want that to disappear. And that's the government's objective. And that's about future jobs and future, future technology and innovation in this country. And that's, that's awesome. Like that's kind of what they should be doing. And, you know, I'm, I'm for one very worried about, you know, the lack of investment going forward into a sector because I think we'll have our lunch eaten by other countries. Um, but that's a government objective, and we all probably subscribe to that. A VC objective is different, and a founder's objective and, and alignment is different. So that's why there's always conflict, and I think they are conflicting views. Should a, should a startup, you know, cash flow negative startup, like we're all working with, should they take on debt? I don't know. Like, that's a really, that debt does genuinely have to be repaid at some point. And I'm not sure that that's a great solution in this, in this situation. It might be for some companies, but for most startups, I think that's probably building a problem for the future that's not the, the, the suboptimal. I think grant capital is great for your government because you're not looking at what's the best technology, you know, which, which we all are, right? Um, you're looking at future jobs and, and you know, the future of, you, of the economy, which why they're supporting e-commerce at the moment is to maintain some level of economic activity. Um, so again, I just take a step back and say, well, let's not flare around, let's not be panicked about this. If you're asking like, what are the right routes? It is company by company. I'm not sure debt is the right answer at all. Um, and equity, like the BUB will look at, is around. There'll be just be some filters, some rules about, you know, probably they'll have their own funds deploy that, and they can't deploy in their own companies and sensible things like that. Um, and founders again, like save my startup. You know, there's a really good article. Well. There's a, there's a provocative article in Sifted, I think it's this morning or last night, from um, Robin Klein of Local Globe, 
basically saying bailout is the wrong approach for tech companies. And again, I just encourage everyone to read that two minute read it's on Sifted right now. Um, so I'm not sure that the right answer is, um, it, the right answer comes from where you're coming from as a government or as a VC fund or as a founder, and they're actually slightly um, conflicted. Yeah, I mean, I, I totally agree. I think um, the problem that really needs to be solved at the moment is a liquidity crisis. So some of the other measures that we have already touched on, such as, you know, accelerating the Innovate UK grants and accelerating R&D tax credits, I think would probably be the yeah. best solution yeah. at the moment. I would, I really do caution the idea of making loans more accessible to startups. So I think long term that be, will actually be detrimental to the startup ecosystem. Um, and I, I definitely don't think it's the right solution for, for the government to be seen as uh, the one that's got to be saving all of the startups out there because, um, you know, there's been a lot of talk as well around potential bridge funding as we've already seen in France and, and Germany uh, through the British Business Bank. But again, I do caution that unless there is a co-investment vehicle where institutional investors are, are co-investing alongside the British Business, Business Bank, so I, I just think that it's not really sustainable in the future unless you have the, the support of investors that will follow on fund the, these companies um, in the aftermath of all of this. Thanks, guys. So we'll kind of move on into our uh, Q&A session and some of the attendees have submitted. So we've got a question here. Um, do you think finance and other business process outsourcing still have future and the current target market at SMEs who are happy to have their accounts remotely? Anyone want to take that? I'm, I missed the end. Say that again. The last sentence I missed. Yeah. So, do you think finance and other business outsourcing still has future? The current target market are SMEs who are happy to have their accounts prepared remotely. Well, just an obvious thing to say is, is when we come out of COVID and, and slightly out of the recession, you know, everybody's talking about how this is going to accelerate digital transformation. Um, for SMEs and larger corporations. So if you can weather the storm, um, you know, a lot of the products that these startups are building, innovations and remote working and, and other forms of efficiencies, you know, the adoption of these solutions may or should be accelerated by the, by the large corporations and SMEs. So absolutely, I think that product sounds, you know, like a, a perfect product for this market. I don't know about the competitive landscape, but it, it will come back. Um, it will come back stronger. stronger. Does anyone have anything else to add to that uh, question? If not, we'll move on to the next one. So the next question is, when raising pre-Series A or an extended C round, how do you put your valuations in place to these the previous raise and valuations? Um, I always like this one because I like to be super blunt about valuation and just to, valuation is you know, a, a, a proper raise, so a raise of like, you know, 500k and, and beyond like, you know, different with angel and friends and family rounds, but a, but a proper raise buys 20, 25% of the business, you know, whether it's seed, series A, series B, et cetera, like things can go super hot and, and get, do less dilution than that, shouldn't ever be more dilutive than that. Um, and if you're doing a job as a fiduciary, you know, investor of other people's capital, you're there anyway. So valuations don't need to change, in my experience. Like we've just closed two investments, like this week and last week. Valuations are set from before. We didn't need to change valuations. Um, so I think valuation is something that people just get way too kind of, I don't understand why it's a very emotive issue, but I think it's actually a much more simple issue than, than, than often, often is the case. So, you know, valuation is, is the price and price is where demand meets supply and guess what there's a lot less supply right now of capital so that means that the price is going to come down there's an inevitability about that because the weight of the gravity of economics right um but also at an early stage you know that's the pricing it's 20 25 percent of the business for, for a proper round whether the market determines how much you can raise the market says yeah this business is ready for 500k this really this business is ready for 2 million whatever it may be and that's based on where you're at the stage of company so I view it really, really simplistically. And I don't think many of that's changed. And, and just to add, I, th I think in this scenario, you've, it sounds like there are existing investors. So I think it's about, you know, 
working through a story with them that, that gives the, the required runway, uh, runway and also um, like the right product market fit coming out of that 12 month or 18 month runway and agreeing it with them. Um, obviously, if you can attract a new investor to the table, then you know, they'll probably tell you what the valuation is. Yeah, we've also got another great question that's come in. Uh, so women and underrepresented founders already receive significantly less investment. This downturn will most likely tighten this. How can underrepresented founders navigate this? Um, David, do you want to kind of take a hit on that? First? Yeah. So again, to kind of link, link in, so we all talk about kind of investment, but there, I know we previously mentioned around opportunities, maybe like looking to acceleration or looking to other ways that you can actually potentially have growth around a concept that is not purely funding at the moment. So there are many organizations out there that are supporting, so Founder for instance, we are continuing to deliver um, accelerate, accelerator courses across weeks on virtually utilizing different platforms. Um, you've got Founders Weekends again, which are giving you opportunities to kind of work, take your concept and actually build and develop further. But most importantly, kind of giving you access to put you in front of people who who have investment, but maybe they can't do so now, but anyway, you're kind of getting access to them. So my um, kind of chime there is that tap into those organizations who actually have that as a mission, as their passion to support that community, who are able to kind of take this opportunity to continue to do that through virtual means and the such. And I know Matt, you and also Yvonne, you, your funds are particularly focused, geared towards you know underrepresented founders. So, what advice would you give to, um, to these? Yeah, so um, the fund. Oh, Matt, Good you're sorry, Yvonne. Go. Okay, so no, no, you go for it. As a fund that is focused on on underrepresented founders, um, so you know we are still continuing to invest. However, we have slowed down. So happy to to you know. Um, continue to review business plans and so on. But I think ultimately you just have to really ensure that you're thinking about the narrative and, and crafting your story in this environment. Um, and be really, really mindful of the fact that uh, you need to really think about how the infusion of capital is going to make your business thrive. And so really be mindful of which investors you're, you're approaching during this particular period. Ensure that they're um, in alignment with the company that you're running. So do you fit within their criteria? And and now is a great time to actually be, you know, reaching out to investors and just saying, hey, do you have 10 minutes um, of, can we have a quick Zoom call, for example, um, and get feedback and, and try and build those relationships as well. Um, the thing I'd add is, I again, I think this is a moment in time to um, take advantage of this situation and to, you know, I think there's an opportunity for less bias in the investment decision making process and you know we all know we should do the stats around how much bias there is in the investment decision making in the uk um and i think this is a moment where you know i talked to a founder the other day about where you know to increase the diversity increase the inclusiveness because we're doing it all remotely and like it just it le it's to some extent it's not as simple as this but it does level the playing field more and so I think that's something to be embraced. I would be, again, like I've got the great privilege of, of optimism, but I would be looking at the situation you know, as an underrepresented founder. Say, how can I use this to my advantage? What does this situation do that gives me that gives me advantages that I didn't previously have? Thanks for that, guys. So we've also had a question come in on uh, whether it's the situation we're currently facing, whether it's a liquidity crisis or whether it's a liquidity crisis and a recession. Um, the question is basically saying that, you know, the expected solutions are different, so which is it? How many differentiate the two? I, I think this is a liquidity crisis debt with an imminent, likely imminent recession that follows um, very quickly afterwards if it's not kind of happening already. So um, that might be where the clarity doesn't kind of fully really sit, but that, that, that is the environment that we are the way in yeah i think uh, coming back to the podcast with with fred destin and and harry stebbings matt that you i listened to that yesterday i think they say for every month of lockdown france is losing like three percent of their gdp so there's there's a, there's a current lockdown which is kind of weird in video calls but that will last a few months then we're going to go into a deep recession that i don't think anybody knows um with potentially like mini lockdowns coming over the next 12 months I don't know. Um, so there's uncertainty just leads to capital flight and 
people preserving their cash plus. There's a load of very, you know, low cost um, equities on the public market. So people with money may prefer to invest their money in the stock market at this time rather than a very early stage tech startup. Um, I think. Sorry, Yvonne, did you want to add something there? No, go ahead, Matt. Yeah, I was just going to say what, um, another question that's coming is what are the opportunities that you see arising post COVID? So again, just touch slightly on this in terms of some development abroad, but again, back to the whole point about how crisis can actually be a great opportunity for innovation. And the fact is that we're going to, we will eventually go back to normal. It will be a new normal, but as human beings over time, we've always evolved and adapt to live in the world where we do live in. And as businesses that serve, um, the startups that serve communities and serve customers, when we get into that new normal, there will be that opportunity. So. There will, there will be kind of a big opportunity coming ahead, but I think the point of bit here is around constantly, if you've got a product, you've got a startup, understanding what is it you're trying to achieve, who are the customers, what is the value add, is this required still? And that is going to probably kind of change a lot over the next couple of months, depending how long we're in lockdown or other situations get put in place. So is being adaptable now and kind of like being fully engaged in that process will help kind of make deal, um, kind of capitalize on opportunities that come post this um, scenario? Yeah, I mean, there are definitely areas like obviously health, health tech, um, future of work, ed tech, um, um, fintech for good, financial inclusion. There are categories um, in, my, in, our port in the Ascension portfolio, but out there that are kind of doing extremely well at the moment, which is unfortunately doing well because of a, of a crisis that's impacting so many people. But there are areas that are going to be high growth areas. And, Obviously, anything around um, circular economy, green, I don't think that's coming off the agenda anytime soon. Mm -hmm. I would say B2B SaaS businesses will, will struggle because I think a lot of enterprises will, um, and anything that's linked to um, advertising revenue, um, more challenging. That's John. Uh, Matt, anything to add to that? I think now is definitely the time to be to be thinking about you know what the world will look like post uh, COVID nineteen and I think one of the interesting areas that I've I've been looking at is is supply chain technology for example because um, I think there's there's definitely opportunities in that given the amount of disruption we've seen in that particular area as a result of this crisis so I think it's it's an opportune time to be digging deep thinking about you know the changes are, are likely to occur as a result of this crisis in both businesses and consumers behaviour. Um, and really seeing how you can leverage those potential opportunities. Thanks for that, everyone. Uh, so we've had another question come in here um, to you guys about if you are making new investments, what sort of startups are you looking for? What businesses do you predict? I mean, we kind of covered this. What business do you predict will ride this way? And have you seen any exciting innovations already come out of this crisis? Matt, do you want to take this one? Okay, um, I think you won't have covered a lot of this, but one of the things that I've always thought about in my investing is um, what's the 10-year cycle that I'm investing into? What's the direction of travel in this sector? And it sounds overly simplified. I think the best things are simple. What, if I'm investing into a rising tide, there's opportunities for more than one company, so it reduces comp competition risk. Um, it you know, cover up a lot of mistakes that are made if the overall market is rising, like, you know, We'll look at e-commerce and logistics, some of the things Yvonne's talking about. That growth isn't going anywhere. You know, even through this, right, we've got an investment in their logistics um, fulfillment technology uh, that I wrote about yesterday. Um, and that's been a protected sector. So there's, there's kind of immediate time frame, and I think for right now, for investors, it's about being, about being calm and not looking to grab things quickly that could help with COVID, because that's a short-term thing. We don't know if it's three months or 13 months, but it's... It's, so I always come back to what's the what's the direction of travel in that sector over the next five to ten years, right? And that's how I think about this question. So I'm not making knee-jerk investments in things that can help with COVID particularly, but I'm looking at things that John's talking about around what is a post-COVID. Well, that's our job, right? We're paid by investors to think about the future, and that's why it's so interesting. But with this particular lens, it's more I'd say it's more continuing to five to ten years. Horizon is what I'm looking at because that's where values create. So that's why venture is about investing through all the cycles. 
we can't time the market the way like hedge fund people and minute to minute investors can. So we have to keep investing. That's always got the funds to do so. Um, and therefore it's so long term, I can't predict what the cycle is going to do next year or in three years time. Uh, but I can try to predict how humans are going to be interacting with each other, buying stuff, living better lives. You know, David said, we're an evolutionary species. We want to move forward. That means we're always trying to increase our standard of living and our quality of life. And that will, that's, a, that's an inevitable trend. Right? That's, a, that's a driving force of trend. So I look at it that way. I'm like, I'm not looking at new things right now that are short-term interesting. I'm looking at how does this accelerate the way we live our lives. So the, the blending of work and work-life balance and all that stuff that we talked about, right? I'm 41 years old. So my generation is the first generation that started to deal with that. Our parents' generation, work stopped at five o'clock and that was it, right? And then it was the other life. So the generations below me, it's all one it's all one thing. I give some time of my week to this company and I do my side hustle here and I, and I work for these portfolio clients over here. Um, so yeah, I, uh, I think it's about the longer term trends. That's how I'm looking at this particular question. So yeah, yeah, I guess this is a kind of, we've got five minutes left. So to kind of wrap up, what would be the main takeaways, the main kind of like headline points that you would say to founders during this time, who are trying to raise series A, Seed, um, you know, don't have a lot of runway. What would be your main takeaway point? So my mine's going to be less on the money aspect. I'm going to touch on don't let um, remember that, that that shouldn't be the only one. It's important, but it's not the only one thing that you should be focused on at this present time. Minus kind of the virus itself and actually the financial impacts. Mental health and well-being is something that's extremely vulnerable at this point in time. So take time for yourself and actually focus and remember that it's not all about moving forward, but how are you personally managing, developing and um, feeling. So actually take time for yourself, focus, and, and don't just be so kind of bogged down on purely money. Is that David? Um, Yvonne? Yeah, for me, it's, it's all about um, trying to be creative because if you are seeking um, venture funding, you know, there, there may be other ways in which uh, you can think about um, gaining more funding, whether it's through, you know, ways in which you can accelerate monetizing your product or even looking at revenue funding. Um, and I think that, you know, review your assumptions, make sure that you are thinking about how your, your narrative is at the moment, craft your story. And, and let's not forget that it's not all doom and gloom at the moment. You know, great businesses can be built and scaled through crisis, as we saw in 2008 and 2009. Um, we saw so many great companies come out of that period. Um, so for me, I'm excited to see, you know, how companies really leveraged opportunities being created in this environment. Um, and that's definitely something the company should really be thinking about now, you know, how to come out of this thriving. Thanks for that. John? Yeah, well, again, if you've raised capital, you know, I would really work with your current investors to come up with a, a plan. If you're trying to raise money, you know, for a new venture, maybe just spend the next six weeks and while we're in lockdown, thinking about it, working on the product and think like differentiate between the lockdown and, and what happens next. The lockdown, I think, is a six week thing and then a recession will come. And so how, how do you fit into that post lockdown world um, and, and use this time to think or, or think about your product or, you know, spend time with your family, be creative. Um, yeah. I don't know. And good luck. Mm. Matt, any last words? Um, yeah, I just reiterate, like, firstly, my advice has been to take a step back. Is this really what you want to do in the environment that's just been painted for you uh, by those investors there? Like, is this really what you want to do for the next three years? Take the mental health point David's making into consideration because it's going to be highly taxing on your mental health. Um, really take time to think step back is if it and if you come to the proactive decision that it is and it fits into those trends and what you want to spend your time doing like find your beast mode like just kind of you know but that's where those those wartime ceos that kind of that that inner kind of you know um zealot comes out and you and, and you've got that motivation because you know it's authentic then at that point so it's not just because it was a cool thing to do and there was some capital available so like really decide that proactively not just like how to kind of, I've got to make payroll, but is this what you want to do for the next three years in a very challenging environment? And if it is, use that power. Like just you know, find that beast mode and go for it. Um, yeah, and like I say, echo everyone else, just, you know, good luck. It's very, very hard out there. 
Cool. Thank you to our panelists um, for taking the time today, kind of speaking through it. So these are, this is our first kind of um, investment series webinars. And um, yeah, it'd be great to get your feedback. So feel free to kind of shoot us a LinkedIn message, tweet um, about today's session. Thank you all for joining. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much.